for the introduction. Um, my name is Geert Wiegertjes indeed, and I'm going to, uh, to come with a completely different presentation as the two presentations before. I'm going to talk about fish health. But first I want to say thank you for inviting me again to Sendai. It's been a great pleasure. It's the third time now that I am allowed to come here. And the nice thing is that I have actually met your samurai in person. And I'm probably one of the few that can say this. So I come from the Netherlands. The Netherlands is on the other side of this large continent. And let's see if it sees. Yes, there, there's a small country there. And probably most of you know the, the city of Amsterdam, our capital city. And more or less at equal height, but then closer to the German border, you find Wageningen. Wageningen is a very small city, about 30, 40,000 people, of which 10,000 are students. So this is what it looks like. Wageningen Life of Sciences, our university is called a University of Life Sciences. Um, you see the traditionally our our cities are concentrated around a church where you can still see some cars now, but these days we have restaurants and bars. It's a very nice place to go to. Our university is, uh, is quite international, um, and typically we've been well known for agriculture, and always we have been teaching in English, starting already from bachelors. And that brings many international students to Wageningen, and we hope to see more Japanese students. So these are the people that I work with, and I want to specifically mention Dr. Ferlanza because she's been working together with me on the subject that I'm going to, going to talk to you about in a moment. Um, so what brings me to Japan? It's not only the long-time collaboration that we have and the long-time understanding we have with people from Japan, but it's mostly koi. And I'm a fish immunologist, and in the Netherlands, most of the time when I say I study the immune system of fish, they look at me and they say, so why? Um, they don't really understand why it's interesting to study the immune system of fish, and especially if you study the immune system of carp, and that is what I do. If I come to Japan and I say I study fish, I'm much appreciated, especially if I say I study carp. So why do we study carp? Carp is a very important species for aquaculture. Cyprinids are actually the most cultured aquaculture species in the world. And the picture you see here is a picture of harvesting carp in Poland. So in Eastern Europe, carp is the main dish on Christmas Eve where you eat fish and you bring the carp home alive. You put it in a bathtub for one or two days such that it cleans and then you prepare this in the oven. So it's a very important species, species to study. And we keep many carp in our uh, aquatic research facility. And we grow them already for 10 to 20 years, which means we have specific pathogen-free carp at our disposable, disposal. And this is very important. If you study the immune system, you want them to be free of diseases. So we know the source of the fish that we work with. Increasingly, we also work with zebrafish. And you can see in this picture the tanks are still empty. This is when we moved into our facility a couple of years ago, two, three years ago. By now, the zebrafish tanks are fully equipped. And zebrafish is taking an enormously, increasingly important role in our research because it brings us transgenics and knockout fish to work with. The problem with zebrafish is that they're small. Carp is much larger. And not everybody may appreciate this until now, but zebrafish and carp are very close. They're both cyprinids, and 90% of their genome may actually be the same. So we can rely on a lot that we find in zebrafish, apply this to carp. So I have to tell you something. I have to introduce you to two viral diseases that are important for the study that I'm going to explain to you in a second. And one of them is what we call koi herpes virus. Koi herpes virus disease was first found in, uh, in Japan, actually, because you have so many koi. Um, it's a herpes virus. It's also called Cyprinus herpes virus, 
three. And the spread very rapidly moved from, from Japan to basically all over the world. Initially, the spread of the disease came with the koi shows that display the beautiful koi all over the world. And koi trans are transported all over the world for display. So this disease very rapidly spread. So if you look at the genome, the genome of koi herpes virus is known. It's, uh, it's presently the largest uh, herpes virus genome that is known. And there's about 155 potential proteins that are encoded through this genome. A number of them, if you look at the sequences, they're predicted to have an immune-related role. And one of them I will highlight today, and that is ORF12. I can't point it, but you can probably read it. There's a number of, of other open reading frames that are important and that are being used to design a vaccine. So um, since recently, people have been able to design a vaccine, a recombinant live vaccine, where you can knock out two of these open reading frames. And if you then infect your carp, they're fully protected. The problem in aquaculture, if you want to vaccinate against these fish, is that it's not allowed to use viral attenuated viruses in aquaculture. But it's very effective. Another disease that you need to know something about is spring viremia of carp virus. It's not a herpes virus, it's a rhabdovirus. And also against this virus we can, in principle, we can vaccinate using a DNA vaccine. The virus is much more simple and it, it expresses as one of the major proteins a G, glyc a glycoprotein. And if we use this glycoprotein and we put it in a plasmid and we inject the fish with this DNA plasmid, we get basically 100% protection. So we can also vaccinate against this disease, but again, it's quite practical or quite difficult to bring this in practice because DNA vac vaccination is still heavily under debate for use in animals. Although very recently the first DNA vaccine has been admitted to the market in Europe for some. So one thing also to realize is that even though fish are vertebrates, and we always say fish are very interesting from an evolutionary point, because they are the first ones that have a fully developed immune system, the first species, animal species of the vertebrates, so they have both innate and adaptive immunity. Um, it's important they're not the same. It's important to realize this. Um, obviously they have gills, um, but also their immune organs are not always the same. So fish don't have bone marrow, and they have what we call a head kidney, and from there we collect the stem cells to work with. But also they have immune tissue in the gills, so we're recently finding out that there is an important immune tissue in the gills, something we never knew until a couple of years ago, but maybe we could have, could have expected this. And also the two holes you see on the head are actually a nose, and also in the nose of fish you, you can find immune tissue. Um, so it's important to realize there's some differences. There's of course many millions years of evolutionary diff difference, and that means that not always anything we find is comparable. So even though we rely a lot on the textbooks that are based on mice, we have to remain very critical on the findings we have. So one thing I want to focus on now is fever. And fever in humans is a mechanism that is important as part of your immune system. And it's well known from humans. And fever is antimicrobial, but it's costly. It's metabolically costly. It takes energy. You have a number of pyrogens that can cause uh, fever. You can have exogenous pyrogens, such as um, bacterial-derived, for instance, LPS, or viral-derived double-stranded RNA. But you can also have endogenous pyrogens. And those are cytokines. Cytokines like interleukin-1-beta, tumor necrosis factor, alpha or IL-6, which is counter-effective. 
Um, and these pyrogens work basically through recognition of toll-like receptors, in the case of the exogenous pyrogens. And then you have a signaling cascade through NF-kappa-B, STAT3, COX-2, and then in the brain you get a production of prostaglandins, and that causes fever. This is the mechanism as we know it from humans. And we were interested in this mechanism because one of the, rec one of the uh, molecules, one of the open reading frames we found in uh, the genome of the Koi herpes virus was a TNF-like molecule. So do fish also express fever? So obviously a fish is a cold-blooded animal, so it cannot produce heat, maybe. So how does a fish express fever? So I want to take you back first to a study that has been done, has been performed first in zebrafish. Um, and in zebrafish, they used the exogenous pyrogens, they used double-stranded RNA and injected the zebrafish with this double-stranded RNA. And what you see in this graph, and it's very important to look at the x-axis, because you have a number of chambers, and they offered the fish the possibility to go to a different temperature. So a number of the chambers had a fixed temperature, and you should know that zebrafish we keep normally at 27 degrees. If you offer these fish the possibility to go to 33 degrees, which is a temperature higher than optimal, these fish used to use this opportunity to swim to the 33 degrees under the influence of these exogenous pyrogens. So if you inject double-stranded RNA, they go to a warmer compartment, which suggests they induce a form of fever. But this is only suggestive. If you measure what happens in these fish, then indeed, as you see in humans, you get a higher production of prostaglandins. So the mechanism by which this induction of going to a warmer compartment, um, the mechanism seems to be conserved also in a fish. If you infect these fish with a virus, and this is where the spring viremia of carm virus um, comes into, then you see that the fish that are offered the possibility to go to a warmer compartment do not show the clinical signs that they would do at a lower temperature. So it seems to be beneficial for these fish to go to a warmer compartment. Suggestive, this may be helpful to go warmer. So this takes me to the first set of conclusions. If you have exogenous uh, pyrogens such as double-stranded RNA, in this case they used a mimic poly-IC, you can induce what we suspect is behavioral fever. It means by behavior you induce a form of fever. Viruses, in this case spring viremia of carp, can induce also this behavioral fever. And fish, and in this case zebrafish, that display this behavioral fever actually show or do not show the clinical signs of the disease. So it seems to be beneficial. So this was the background knowledge we had when we started our study on carp. So this is based on a publication we, we uh, published this year, early this spring. So if you want to read more about this publication, you can do so later. And I want to show you a video that shows the experimental setup that we've used to study the behavioral fever in carp. Let's see if I can start the video, which doesn't seem to move. Yes. So you see a, uh, a replicate setup where we have, where we offer the fish the possibility to choose between 24, 28, and 34 degrees. 
And in the left setup, you will see in a moment the fish that are mock infected. So do not get the viral disease. And you see the fish prefer to be at 24 degrees. There's only the occasional fish that is at 28. There it is. It peaks. But most fish prefer 24 degrees. That is the temperature a carp likes best. Now on the right side, and you have to realize the high temperature is now on the left, the fish, when they are infected with the virus, they prefer to go to a higher temperature, 28 or even 34 degrees. You see in the middle there are some fish that are clearly diseased. It takes a number of days before these fish, let's say, realize that it's beneficial to go to a higher temperature. You also saw one fish on the right, 24 degrees, which seemed to be quite happy. And that could be a fish that already was at a higher temperature and moved back. So it looks or quite obvious in our experiments. We, have, uh, we see when we have fish that um, display Corey-Herpes virus disease, and we offer them the possibility to go to a higher temperature, they actually are cured from the inf infection. So it's curative. It's a behavioral fever that is curative. So now coming back to this ORF, this open reading frame 12. If we model this open reading frame 12, and you see it on the top, and we model it on the human crystal of TNF with TNF receptor, you see it overlaps for a very large part with the TNF receptor. So the ORF 12 seems to encode or seems to drive the production of a protein which looks like the TNF receptor. And ORF12, if you look at the supernatants of the cells that we grow the virus in, is a very abundant protein. So what you see on this graph is you see the wild-type virus. You also see a deleted ORF12 mutant, and you see a revertent in which we put back the ORF12. At the arrow, you see a very high production of this protein. So then we studied whether this TNF receptor, or this supposedly TNF receptor, can actually interact or bind the TNF from carp. So here you see an ELISA, and you see the binding of the supernatant from the cells in which we um, grow the virus. And only in the ORF12 or in the revertent strain, you see in ELISA, you see a reaction between the TNF and the TNF receptor, the soluble TNF receptor from the virus. But you do not see it in the mock-infected uh, mock cells. And if we used a NF-kappa-B reporter assay, um, which reacts to TNF, and we co-incubate the carb TNF with the antibody or with the soluble receptor, I should say, from the virus, you could see the blocking of the activity on the NF-kappa-B reporter assay, which shows that we have an interaction between the carb TNF and the TNF receptor, the soluble TNF receptor from the virus. So ORF12 has the structural features of a TNF receptor. It's one of the most abundant proteins. It can block the activation of cells that is normally done by TNF via the NF-kappa-B signaling route. And it looks like the KHV, it induces a soluble decoy receptor for TNF that stops or that blocks the activity of TNF. So what does the TNF do? Does indeed the TNF drive these fish when they are infected with the virus? Does it drive these fish to show behavioral fever? Because remember, TNF was one of these cytokines that could drive fever in humans. And you see it here. So on the left graph, you see the injection of a control antibody, so a non-specific antibody against uh, anything unrelated but not against TNF. And on the right graph, we've injected an antibody during the infection. We've injected an antibody against TNF, blocking the activity of TNF in vivo. You see on the left graph that the red lines is showing the number of fish that go to the warm compartment. And on the left graph, you see there is a peak in the 
fish that move to the warm compartment, so you see a peak in the red line. Whereas on the right graph, you see there's hardly a peak of the red line. There's hardly fish moving to the warm compartment. And you see the, the signs um, that, that uh, the omegas, I think they're omegas, right? Um, they depict the number of fish that die on the, on the right. So the moment you inject the fish um, that are infected with this virus with an antibody against the TNF, it blocks the whole process. The fish cannot do display the behavioral fever, which is normally a curative thing. So anti-TNF can prevent the TNF alpha induced migration to the warm compartment, the behavioral fever. TNF alone, and I haven't got the graph here, can also induce behavioral fever. So if we took a plasmid that expresses the TNF only, and we inject it in these fish without any form of infection, also the expression of TNF only lets, induces the fish to move to a warm compartment. So TNF is an endogenous pyrogen as it is in mammals. So if we summarize this on the left, maybe I start on the right. On the right, if you delete of 12 so the soluble TNF receptor, and you infect these fish, you have a normal production of TNF, and you have an early onset of behavioral fever. But on the left, the virus tries to counteract the effect of the, of the host. The virus produces or stimulates the production of a soluble receptor, which blocks the activation of TNF, which induces the fish to go to a warm compartment and cure the the infection, but in this case it cannot, so you get a delayed response and the fish are much more, more sick. So we have a very nice interaction between what the virus tries to do and what the host tries to do and a counter um, effect of the two. So this also means that all the experiments we do, and we like to do in fish, we like to do experiments at a controlled temperature because we think as scientists it's important to control the temperature to a plus or minus two degree setting because fish are cold for uh, blood of vertebrates and we know at different temperatures you get different reactions. We also realize that if you offer the fish the choice for a different temperature, you get a totally different outcome of your experiment. So maybe where we decide to do controlled temperature experiments, we have made the wrong choice if you want to study the immune system of fish. So I have to mention Alain van der Plasse on this because he is the virologist that did all the virology approach. We worked together with him on this story. He is from Liège, the University of Liège in Belgium. And as a message, I want to give you, I think I have the time, yes, a small second example of what we can learn or what is different in the fish situation. Um, and I'll take you to a second infectious agent, and that is a trypanosome. So again, this centers around TNF, and I'm highlighting TNF only as an example, and it's only one gene, but we've learned more and more that even though if we find a molecule in the, let's say, carb genome, and we look at the sequence, TNF, or typically cytokines, are not very conserved at first sight. They have 30% the same coding sequence. If you look at the conserved regions, they will be much higher. But we always say in a fish situation, you need to study the function of these molecules one by one. What I also did not highlight in the previous study is carp is a tetraploid, which means often we find four times the molecule of which we find what we find in humans. And we think in fish that the different forms, the different expressed genes have different functions. So when you take all the functions of a TNF in human, it may be that the functions are subdivided over the different copies of the gene we find in a fish. So what we found when we first studied TNF and we made recombinant TNF and we made it in bacteria, we made it in insect cells, 
We made it in eukaryotic cells. And we studied the effect of ma on macrophages, and TNF is supposed to activate macrophages. We could not find any of the prototypical effects that TNF should have. And we wondered whether TNF actually had the function as we find it in a mammal. At that time, we did not know its role in behavioral fever. So we have a trypanosome model in the lab, and we can infect carp with trypanosomes. And I'm just displaying a phylogeny tr phylogenetic tree. Um, we have two parasites, two trypanosomes, that fall in the tree that you know much better from mammals. So trypanosomes are the, the, the parasites that cause sleeping sickness in mammals. Um, we have an equivalent in fish, and I'm, I'm dealing now with trypanoplasma borelli, which is a bit of an ancient form of the trypanosomes. And if you look during the infection on the upper right graph, you see a line bar. And the line shows the development of the trypanosomes in the blood over weeks. So it takes about three weeks before these parasites peak um, in fish, in carp. And you have a number of genes here expressed. So we took the RNA, we did um, real-time PCR. And if you look at the two left, those are the two TNF responses. At that, that moment, we had two genes, two copies of TNF. And as a comparison, you see on the right, you see inducible nitric oxide synthase. Uh, these parasites typically induce a lot of nitric oxide, and we know that gene always reacts around the peak. So you see TNF peaks around the moment that also these parasites peak. But what does this mean? So we studied the TNF in vivo, because in vitro we couldn't solve the problem. And we studied it in vivo in three ways. So normally your TNF is brought to the membrane, and then it's cleaved by an enzyme, TNF-converting um, enzyme, TNF-alpha-converting enzyme, or TACE. And it's brought to another cell which has a TNF receptor. So we had a number of ways that we could manipulate this process in vivo. And one of them was injecting PTX, which should stop the transcription of the gene, of the TNF gene. Um, we could inject more TNF, so we injected plasmids that would encode for TNF, so we get more TNF. You get more TNF in the, in the body, and therefore more TNF should be recognized by TNF receptors. And the third, may, the third method we had in hand was using a TACE inhibitor, and this TACE inhibitor would prevent the TACE from doing its work and TNF would stay on the membrane rather than it being cleaved. So that's what we did. So we have three ways. So first, if you look at the inhibition, um, if we stop the production of TNF, what happens? So on the top graph, you see the survival of the fish. On the lower graph, you see the number of parasites. So basically, the survival goes down and the number of parasites go up if you do not have TNF. So TNF is needed to control this parasite. That would be the, the conclusion. So that would possibly mean if you inject more TNF, that should be beneficial to clear the parasite. So that's the next. So don't look at all the bars on the top. We injected a lot of plasmids. We used combinations of TNF 1 and 2. We tried everything, low dose, high dose. But basically, if we inject more TNF, we only get more inflammation. But it didn't cure the disease. But unsurprisingly, if we used a taste inhibitor, and we injected this taste inhibitor during the moment that we already had a, number, a large number of parasites in the blood, because you can regularly keep bleeding your fish, so you know exactly how many parasites you have. The moment you inject this taste inhibitor, two days later, all parasites were gone. Completely disappeared from the system. So that means somehow this membrane TNF plays a major role in controlling this parasite infection. And if you looked at the taste inhibitor or its control compound, also the nitration that we see is so heavily correlated to these infections with trypanosomes completely is reduced. 
So we concluded that membrane TNF is playing a major role in these infections against these trypanosomes. And we don't know how it works. We know if we take this taste inhibitor in vitro, it doesn't kill the parasites. We did all the controls. If you go to our textbooks <coughs> on mice, hardly anybody studies membrane TNF. Everybody thinks in soluble TNF as the main important factor. Um, and we have been developing a trypanosome model now in zebrafish, such that in the future we can knock out or um, make a knockout, for instance, for membrane TNF, and study this model also in the zebrafish and solve why this membrane TNF is playing such an important role. So conclusion, TNF, even though we find a molecule that looks like the TNF of a mammal, it smells like the TNF of a ma mammal, we can model it, we can take it, put it on a 3D model of human TNF, it all seems to fit. If you work on fish, be critical because the outcome is always different. So that was my last, my last wise words. Um, if you ever come to the Netherlands, I would advise you to go to uh, The Hague. In The Hague, we have a very beautiful museum. It's by Escher. Um, he actually spent some time in Japan, so he appreciated very much the, uh, the art in Japan and was inspired by this, but you also see he appreciated fish a lot. It's a very beautiful museum and much appreciated also by scientists. And by that I would like to close. Thank you.